when talking about books that we love, it's hard to contain ourselves and not reveal the entire plot line. But for some books, that's exactly what you must do. You want to give all the details, all the information, and you know there's still a lot to be discovered by the reader. That's the case of the book we're going to discuss today, The Spy and the Traitor by Ben McIntyre. This is a true espionage story that, that happened during the Cold War. And my guest for today's show is Diane Pure. Diane is the person that you need to call if you need to know who is who in West Maui and what's happening in West Maui. If you want to promote an educational event, a social cause, a scholarship, you need to contact Diane. Just like me, Diane participates in several uh, book clubs, but it is the Great Decisions discussion group that allowed us to have some wonderful conversations about world affairs. Diane, thank you so much for joining me today. And I appreciate the invitation. I'm gonna start with an easy question. Did you enjoy this read? Absolutely. I found it to be on so many levels, a character study. Um, why does someone put themselves through that? Uh, so I found that to be very interesting and the story itself, and also uh, the procedures uh, that they go through. And so I found it a very, very interesting book on several levels. Well, I agree with you. And I've been thinking about the story in this book, or actually the multiple stories, because we start discussing the title and it may appear very simple. Gordievsky is um, a spy, and um, he is the one that, because of him, um, an international conflagration was avoided. And Aldrich James is the CIA agent that is the traitor that revealed all these secrets and uncovered Gordy. But it is a matter of vantage point because if we are the Soviets, or we look at it from the Soviets' perspective, then Gordievsky is the traitor and Ulrich is the spy. And furthermore, both Gordievsky and Ulrich Ames are actually um, agents. They were, they're spies. They were trained to, um, to work in intelligence services. And they're also traitors because they betray their government. So is this only Gordievsky's story or is it? more than that. I thought it was more than that because they were both doing it for different reasons. And this is uh, when I think of the characters and the character study. Um, Gordievsky came from a family of KGB. His father was in KGB, his brother was in KGB. Uh, his brother was an illegal, which means he goes underground. It's like uh, those that go undercover in a police department. And so, and he was, his brother was totally devoted, as was the father. They don't question, they just do. But like in every family, there is one that starts to question. Uh, many times it's the second child, it doesn't matter in this case. But Gordievsky was had an inquiring mind. And I think he was a good observer. And he realized that things should be different. He was concerned about his people, the people of Russia. And he felt that there was uh, too much of, of a difference. You had the people uh, pushing him off in the street. And yet you had those in their DACAs. And it wasn't, for communism, it was supposed to be more equal. And so, he, and he had a, a very, um, he had an appreciation for uh, the culture and for the arts. And he feel, felt that there should be more of that in Russia. So he, it was really the quality of life is what I'm saying for the people of Russia. And I think that is part of why he did what he did. 
on the other yes, hand, no, no, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. On the, so it was ideology, in my view, basically. In the case you of Aldrich. just spoke my mind that it was ideology for him. And by right. um, uh, comparison, um, Aldrich Ames, for him, it was all about money. He just wanted more money. And for our viewers, I'm going to disclose one fact. And that is that over time, the Russians paid Aldrich Ames over $4 million. And it went for years before he was discovered and nobody noticed a sudden increase in his wealth for a, somebody that was making $50,000 a year on paper. So yes, I agree with you. It's ideology versus plain money, like a typical cliche. Exactly. But I also think once you get past that, um, to do this, you have to have some ego because you're, you're playing a game and it's beating the, what are the chances that you will get caught. And so it's how you play the game as well. Um, in the case of Aldra James, I was amazed at how long it took them to figure that out. Um, he was never well thought of. Is it bureaucracy you think that took so long for him to be discovered? Or um, I don't know, maybe the plan was to let um, information unravel and maybe catch others and you know, have enough proof. Like every bureaucracy and every corporation, you have those who are uh, people who get away with these things. Everybody knows that he's a heavy drinker. Uh, they know that he's not the most ambitious person in the world. Uh, it was indicated that a lot of the P uh, KGB were that way. Uh, they weren't totally ambitious. And um, the whole tempo allowed both of them to get away with it. In the case of Aldra James, it was a very long time. And it was because they really weren't paying attention, as you say, until it reached the point where he had so much money and he was spending it uh, so freely that they had to question it, which really surprised me. I am the case of um, Odieski. Um, I was just surprised that it took him so long. Well, and he actually refused compensation in the beginning. That's right. And it was later on that started to accept some money. And, um, you know, he, he came from a completely different uh, place, I think. But if you um, look at the definition of a spy in the dictionary, um, that is a person that basically collects information and reports information about the activities and actions of either um, an enemy or a competitor. And during the Cold War, it was very clear who are the enemies. It was very clear who's spying on who and why, what, what is the reason. But in today's world, the spying activity is still going on strong. Um, Two weeks ago, an article in Financial Times said that Russian espionage is at an all-time high in Switzerland. In addition to that, there was a um, Spanish citizen that turned out, journalist, that turned out to be uh, an agent for the Russians during the beginning of the Ukraine war. And um, there is a Russian spy that, you know, uh, applied for an internship at The Hague, was spying on um, cases with the International Court of uh, Criminal Court. So obviously this activity is going. And so who are today's enemies or who are uh, the competitors and what are they spying for? I was trying to figure out why uh, Gordievsky 
was doing this. And I think a lot of it had to do with culture and the quality of his people. And he was impressed by what happened with the Prague Spring. And then because he had a facility for languages, he was sent to Berlin, East Berlin, as his first uh, assignment because he spoke German fluently. And in the spy business, speaking languages very fluently is very important. And so he arrived the day before the wall went up. And the wall originally, there was a small wall across a, a street, a major thoroughfare, not that wide by standards now, but it was there, there was a wall. I think there was a place for people, for a car to get through, but maybe just one. They had, um, I could be wrong, but they had the wire uh, and uh, you had uh, uh, guards in a tower there. And you see it in newsreels from the old days. But suddenly I, it was, and here was, I pardon? I'm sorry. Do I recall correctly that you were in Berlin in the late 50s, early 60s? So you've seen with your own eyes some of these. Um, right. I, mean, uh, I was very fortunate. I was a teenager, and teenagers are very impressionable. So I just soaked it all in, and I had opportunities to experience things that people don't usually experience as a teenager. I will just mention one thing as an example of a spy gathering information. This is a picture of my father. It's a caricature. He actually looked much better than that, but it was a caricature. Every officer and his wife at the officers club was, which was Harnick House, um, had one of these. Everybody got one. And it was a German artist, very talented one. In fact, I want to say this is about 63, 64 years old, probably 63. Look at the colors and how, and I have just thrown it in a drawer all these years. But look at how fresh the colors are still. So whatever they used, it worked. Um, bottom line is- Were you, were you like at that time, were there discussions about spies? Were your family have these conversations that somebody may be spying on us or things like that? It was spy. It, this was the land of spies. Berlin probably still is. Uh, everything that was happening was happening in Berlin. And uh, there were Russian spies, there were American spies. Counterintelligence was really starting to come into its own. So uh, it, we were there as a defense force uh, because we were surrounded by East Germany uh, uh, to protect the Germans because we know the story of Hitler who killed 20 million Russians. So they weren't too happy with the Germans. So we were there as a protection force. Um, so the answer is yes. and. Um, I interacted with those who were as a babysitter. So we know what they were spying about. You know, it was the, uh, everybody wanted to know who's got the nuclear weapons and when they may engage them. But in today's world, what do you think the spying activity is about? Is it arms based? nuclear based is it information about maybe a, a more commercial nature of technology and so on i think what, what are they spying about i think it's part of all of that uh technology they are giving us a run for our money in technology with the hacking and so forth uh and media influence it's a war uh of tech in the technological field I'm sure we are doing the same in outer space. We are being challenged in outer space. Um, so I think it's, but I think it's basically the same. It's just become far more sophisticated. 
I think that's what the difference is. Yeah. And one of the things that I loved about this book, and actually all of Ben McIntyre's book, you really learn a lot about spycraft, the planning, the number of people that are involved, the things they do. It, 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 for me, it's really, really good, and good information to know. But I wonder, how did technology change all that? Because spying in the 60s is totally different from today. Back in the 60s, you had to create a persona for somebody. And you know they all had fake names, fake passports, and stories. In today's world, you go on Facebook, and you create a persona in two minutes with friends and relationships and jobs, and you name it. And you just have to then have the actual person to match the Facebook profile. So in a way, I think it's easier. But at the same time, uh, we're more exposed to uh, scrutiny because you know you have there's so such we have so much access to information. It's so easy to verify things on one hand. On the other hand, it's easy to hide them. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I think it's more challenging because uh, it's competing with people. Um, those that are technical and always coming up with new things. Um, and for those of us who are uh, technically challenged, it's really amazing. But there, it's so far easier to influence. And because we have so many people on media, uh, they don't understand that they're being influenced. And this is the uh, frightening part because in today's world, you can have a small group that is really influencing uh, technology media all around the world. Where before it was, it was done and affecting the East versus the West, but now it's all over the world. So that you have all these, uh, very well you have china you have russia you have iran uh you have saudi arabia and so forth and not to mention the united states um so i think it's far more complex uh and much more challenging but you still need the people on the ground so nothing takes the place of a human person on the ground because there are things you can have online, but hearing it from another person face to face can be different. So I think you need all those things. Uh, so I think it's far more of a, my opinion is it's far more challenging now. And it wasn't easy then. Well, I want to share with our viewers that um, last week I went to New York and I visited the spy museum in new york which is an experiential museum besides all the exhibits that you can enjoy and you learn a lot about spycraft and um you'll see on your screen right now some of the images from the museum they also do assessments so you do these tests and then at the end of your experience you're giving an assessment that you might be good for surveillance or you may be good for uh, encryption or things like that. It was a, a, a very good um, uh, museum to, to go see. So I strongly uh, recommend it to everybody. And that's where I bought this wonderful shirt that says question everything. And you can even buy a shirt that says secret agent, but I've avoided that. <laughs> and uh, they also have a huge library of books about spies and um, spycraft fiction and nonfiction. So definitely a place to, to see. So um, I know that you also want to share with us a personal story about spying. Okay, as I told you, um, and we talked about the pieces, you have those like uh, the men that they rose in the ranks and they were in a situation of getting all this information. But then you have those who are the ones who get pieces of information as the artists did just drawing in the officer's club. 
Well, one day I got a call about two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm 14, 15 years old. Summer afternoon around two o'clock from my father who said, Diane, there's a, uh, a dog across the street. The people cannot walk it today. The owners can't walk it. So would you please go over to the apartment across the street and get the dog? It's apartment one. So I go over. Now, mind you, I've never been around a dog. I go over. I buzz the buzzer. I'm buzzed in. A woman hands me the leash and the dog and says, don't let go of this leash and be back at five o'clock. So I walk out the door with the dog. I don't question. Uh, I walk out the door with the dog and I decide to go to the AYA, which is the American Youth Association where we all met. I walked in the door with this dog and the, all the uh, other friends and so forth came towards me because I happened to be walking with a standard size, fluffy, beautiful, white poodle who was not only a show dog, it was a champion. And so I walked around with this dog. It got a lot of attention. I was queen of May that day. At about quarter of five, I knew I had to get back to get this dog back on time. I walked over there and buzzed the buzzer, gave the woman the dog with the leash, and I left. About two months later at dinner, my husband, my father said to me, I remember the dog you walked about two months ago? Yes. Well, it seems the dog walker was a Russian spy and they arrested her while you were walking the dog. So I did my little bit for freedom. Yeah, I'm amazed they didn't have a microphone on the dog to record information. Probably it was kind of hard in the 60s, but totally doable in today's world. A mini microphone on the collar and then, you know, uh, who's going to withhold secrets from a nice dog, right? Exactly. And the two people who own the dog were intel people, both the husband and wife. So they were a good source if indeed they were uh, uh, not being as uh, strong as they should be, uh, careful as they should be. Well, I know if I've learned something from this book or something that stayed with me is that there may not be anything like a coincidence, but nothing is a coincidence because you read all the details about the planning of Gordievsky's distraction and his spy work and so on, and you realize that you know coincidences may not be occurring as often as you think, maybe just planned. But um, Diane, I thank you so much for joining me today for this wonderful conversation and for your personal input and sharing your personal stories with us. Well, thank you, and I'll tell you my. Uh, um, my my idea out of the box idea of what really happened for him we'll talk okay about i'm it. looking forward to, <laughs> to hearing that and uh, for viewers if you want to enhance your reading there is another a new book out um, it is by robert bear and it's called the fourth man because we know of three um, agents that have betrayed or they have conveyed uh, secrets to the Russians, but apparently there is a fourth one, and this book talks about that, and it's a nonfiction book. So I hope that uh, you read that one too, and again, read everything that you can. Ahuiho! Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. 
You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.